Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Ricardo Hausmann. I'm a professor sure. here at the Kennedy School, and I'm the director of the Center for International Development. Uh, tonight is a special uh, forum event because we're using it to kick off a symposium on inclusive growth and development that um, the Center for International Development is organizing uh, together with the World Economic Forum and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Um, the World Economic Forum has made uh, inclusive growth one of its uh, uh, main topics of concentration. And in that process, they've created a, a global agenda, what they call Meta Council on Inclusive Growth, which they have asked me to chair. And as one of the activities of that Council on Inclusive Growth, uh, we have crowdsourced ideas on how to uh, promote development. We got over 110 ideas, uh, and we chose 11 of those ideas through a vetting process that we will be discussing tomorrow as the symposium continues. And uh, those of you who uh, want might follow it uh, in, uh, by, uh, through our streaming process. Uh, in addition uh, to the World Economic Forum, this event is happening thanks to uh, the contribution from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, which is uh, also a partner in this, in this effort. If, if you look at the world from a faraway perspective, growth has really never been inclusive in the sense that it's a process that happened in some countries after the Industrial Revolution uh, and not in many other places to the same extent, so that uh, gaps between rich and poor countries that used to be something of an order of factor of four have become gaps of a factor of 250 to one. Uh, and these enormous differences uh, between countries are also mirrored by enormous differences within countries. So there are, uh, you know, it's easy to find, say, states in, in the developing world where incomes are nine times higher than in other states. Uh, so, so this is a process that, uh, that is, uh, has always been a challenge. Uh, there is a fundamental distinction that I would think is very important when we think about inclusive growth, is that a lot of these differences in income are driven by very large differences in productivity. Uh, so it's not about what is your share of, of the pie, it's just that people in different places are creating pies of very different size. And it's uh, the process, the, the idea of inclusive growth is that the world has traditionally seen the challenge as creating growth and then sharing the growth with the people who did not sort of participate in it through some kind of redistribution. And while redistribution is always an important aspect of living in a society, part of the problem has been that we have not included people in the growth process. So inclusive growth, in some sense, is about including people in higher productivity forms of organizing so that they are empowered to create uh, their own wealth. Uh, just co compensating them for their lack of inclusion is always the second best. So uh, the 11 ideas that we have uh, looked at are about including people in the possibilities of higher productivity, uh, whether it's including them in the networks that it would make them access inputs like electricity or IT or communications or, or knowledge of, or information or access to labor markets or social networks and so on. And so those are some of the 11 ideas that, that we, we are, are going to be discussing. Uh, tonight, uh, we start with um, uh, a discussion with uh, Larry Summers uh, Larry Summers doesn't need much introduction in this, in this audience, but let me just say that I first met Larry when he was one of the youngest tenured professors at Harvard. Uh, then I met him when he was the chief economist of the World Bank. Then I met him again when he was in charge of the International Finance Department at the Treasury. I went to see him again at the House Friend when Harvard offered me a job, he was then Secretary of the Treasury. And I asked him, should I take the Harvard offer? And he told me, you never say no to Harvard. <laughs> uh, what did I know that a couple of years later, he was the Harvard president? 
and 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 after that, you know, he was uh, in the in the in the Obama administration as the head of the National Economic Council. And now I'm extremely, extremely proud to call him my colleague here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he's going to be interviewed by John Authors. John has been 25 years at the Financial Times, which means that he must be one of the guys I have read most often in my whole life. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, a very, very gifted um, uh, journalist, and I also am happy to say that uh, that uh, we've, we've, he's interviewed me in the past, and, and I ha have a very high regard for him. Before I, I, I formally let the panel go on, I would like to introduce my partner, uh, Richard Samens, who up to recently was the, the managing director of the World Economic Forum. He's now a member of the board of, ma of, of directors of the, of the World Economic Forum in charge of and he's in charge of this whole Global Agenda Council initiative uh, for the World Economic Forum. And he's our partner uh, in that organization. So without any further ado, Richard, welcome. Good evening. About 20 years ago, the World Bank released a landmark report called the East Asian Miracle. Uh, and the bank's research team, and it was a very distinguished research team, examined uh, the roots of how eight high-performing Asian economies uh, achieved high growth with equity, quote unquote. And they found that the, the equity aspect of that experience was not an accident. It was not a natural or inevitable byproduct of strong growth itself, but the result of these economies adopting a series of specific institutional mechanisms tailored to the goal of equitable growth. Education, land reform, small, uh, and small business uh, support, housing, labor management relations, insulation of policy making from rent seeking behavior, uh, integrity in public administration, business government relations, and the like. They identified a, a range of different incentives, policy incentives, institutional uh, mechanisms, enforcement capabilities, administrative capabilities that were part and parcel of the success story in East, East Asia. Similarly, in our country here in the US, in the first several decades of the 20th century, we also went, underwent a, a systematic process of institutional deepening in an equally broad spectrum of different areas of economic policy. Labor, competition, social insurance, securities markets, banking, you know the story, infrastructure and the like. These supported the, the expansion, accelerated the expansion of the middle class, supporting its purchasing power and, and supporting aggregate, aggregate demand and in the process contributing to a more resilient uh, growth model. Indeed, probably higher growth in and of itself. We at the forum, since we hold summits around the world, have been listening to the debate on inequality and pronouncements by leaders of all sorts, rich country and poor country, about the need for a more inclusive growth model. And we have been struck by the seeming narrowness and polemicization of the debate. When it does go beyond problem identification, uh, it usually focuses very, very rapidly on two things, Techno technological change, uh, and therefore the response has to be more education. And I won't talk much about the cost-benefit ratio of uh, more college or tertiary education here in the States, which I know is a, is a rising issue, or redistribution, the tax code. But history and recent scholarship about the, the salience of institution building for development tell us that it's not just these two domains that can have a material influence on how inclusive both the process and the outcomes from growth may be. Institutions, rules, and incentives in a wide spectrum of areas really do matter in this respect. So we at the Foreman decided to take this historical experience and scholarships seriously, and we just a few weeks ago released a big uh, cross-country benchmarking report with data, com comparable data, in 15 different areas of the institutional enabling environment in areas that matter, like those I mentioned earlier, covering about 112 countries 
and 140 uh, different uh, indicators. These country profiles that we released in this inclusive growth and development report are like diagnostic scans, scans, MRIs, if you will, of how robust the institutional enabling environment is uh, for inclusive uh, growth. The hope is that by providing some benchmarking information to enable countries to see where they have available policy space based on the historical experience of their peers, we can help to nudge the debate onto a bit more practical and actionable ground and away from the hand-wringing and the diagnosis on the one hand or the very narrow and sometimes polemical discussion about uh, redistribution and education, as important as those elements can be to a successful strategy. If technological change, trade, and deregulation scale returns to capital and innovation, then this is a way of thinking about how one optimizes the other elements of the domestic institutional enabling environment to countervail those concentrating influences. We also release a dashboard of national KPIs, key performance indicators, for those who want to see a, a, a bird's eye view of national performance, including but beyond just GDP growth uh, per capita. Tomorrow begins the second stage of our work, and that is to begin to look uh, and, and capture, as Professor Hausman has said, a body of good practice of policy, corporate practice, and public-private or multi-stakeholder practices in areas that can make also a meaningful contribution to the inclusivity of a country's uh, growth model. I'd like to thank uh, Ricardo in particular, but also Harvard's Center for International Development, our colleagues at MasterCard, uh, and particularly the innovators who have the 11 uh, different practices that we'll be looking at in depth uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank them very much and congratulate them for, for this cooperation. And with that, I look forward to the rest of the discussion this evening. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for these, those kind introductions. I'm most flattered to, uh, to be invited to do this. I'm John Orcas from the Financial Times. By, um, by a pleasant coincidence, my very first taste of this country was now more than 30 years ago when I was an exchange student just up the road in Belmont, Massachusetts. And uh, back when I was 18, I felt incredibly cool hanging out in Harvard Square. Uh, I still like being in Harvard Square, but now I largely feel very old hanging out there rather than, uh, rather than particularly hip. Now, protocol demands, even though he needs no introduction to any of you, that I should introduce you to... Uh, Lawrence H. Summers, who is the Charles W. Eliot University Professor, President Emeritus at Harvard University, and Director of the University's Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government. Uh, as a loyal FT colleague, uh, correspondent, I should also mention that he's in many ways a colleague of mine, as I'm glad to say he writes very regular columns for us, helps us frame and set the macroeconomic agenda. Now, the topic for today, obviously, is inclusive capitalism, inclusive uh, prosperity. Now, Larry, you've been part of writing a report for the uh, Commission on Inclusive Prosperity. You've also been a, an active participant in now regular uh, conferences on inclusive capitalism held in London. It's obvious that there is a concern that there is a lack of inclusiveness in capitalism at the moment. Can we start by um, defining for us what you mean by the phrase inclusive prosperity or inclusive um, capitalism and what is the problem of ex exclusion? Who is being excluded? Let me just say that I'm uh, glad to see so many old friends in the audience. I'm glad to be here with you, uh, John. I'm glad to be uh, <coughs> working with... Uh, my good friend Ricardo Hausman, who I think has done such great leadership uh, for uh, the Center for International uh, Development. Uh, I don't find myself in agreement with very much of what the World Economic Forum says on these matters, <laughs> but I appreciate the uh, extent and sincerity of uh, their efforts. Um, inclusive prosperity means uh, economic growth in which everybody shares. Right. And that is central to a healthy society. By and large, societies succeed when parents can be confident that their children will live better lives than they did. 
by and large, societies fail when parents come to doubt that children will leave better lives uh, than uh, they did. Inclusive prosperity, a sense that everybody is on a rising escalator is something that I believe is crucial uh, to the health of any society. It's in doubt in uh, the United States uh, right now. You've all heard uh, the statistics, uh, the incomes of the top 1% have risen more rapidly over the last 35 years than incomes in China. Right. Uh, the incomes of the average person as measured in our official statistics are essentially stagnant and even if you correct for some errors, the rate of growth is uh, pretty limited. But here's maybe another way of saying it and gauging the extent of uh, the difference. If you look at what's happened to life expectancy at age 50, it's always been the case that those who were more affluent and more educated lived longer than those uh, who uh, weren't. But in the last, uh, but if you look at people who turned 50 in 2010, that is people who were born mm. in 1960, and you look at their life expectancy, and you compare it with the life expectancy of people who turned 50 in 1980, and you look at their life expectancy. For those in the lower half of the population, there was essentially no gain in life expectancy. For those in the top fifth of the population, there was an eight-year gain in life right. expectancy. To put in perspective what an eight-year gain in life expectancy means, if you take a 50-year-old and you supposed that their risk of dying from cancer was completely eliminated, it would add about three and a half years to their life expectancy. So the difference between the most fortunate among us right. and the average among us between 1980 and 2010 is twice cancer. That's a society that is not functioning with full effectiveness right. at including everybody in its successes, and we've got to find ways of doing better. Okay, plainly that is morally insupportable. What, what's your diagnosis for what has gone wrong over those 30 years? I mean, the period you started with there, you start with the beginning of the, the Reagan era, well, what is, what is, what, I chose what, that. How are you diagnosed? Just, just, just in fairness, I, yes. those are the numbers for which these statistics right. have been carefully calculated. <laughs> so there was no political agenda between okay. uh, behind okay, my, right. choice, uh, my, <laughs> my choice, my choice, my choice of th of, uh, uh, of hmm. thirty years. I would guess that rising inequality of income is a function of uh, three things. It's a function of technologies that have reinforced the skills of the hyper-talented more than they've reinforced the skills right. of average people and then in some cases have substituted for the skills of uh, Average people. So people say in bu people say in business that executives have a much greater span of control than they used to. Another way of saying that is that there's much less need for middle management, and so having a really great CEO is even more economically beneficial for a company than it used to be. That's part one. Part two is uh, that uh, globalization has benefited some and has not benefited others. If you are a leading management consultant or a fantastically skilled software designer, the world is now your oyster right. and there is a far greater market for what you do than there ever was before and that is terrific for you. If you make shoes, there is more competition for you than right. uh, there has ever been. And so the reality of globalization 
is pressures that reward some at uh, the expense of others. Third piece is that we live in a more ruthless and market competitive economy, which brings some benefits but leads to uh, less in, uh, leads to more inequality. I'll give you an example uh, close to home. Professors are more likely to move from one university to another university than they used to be. Right. And as a consequence, if you look at the inequality of salaries within a given Harvard department, it's much wider today than it used to be. Not because people really want to create inequality, but because they have no choice. If they don't, the most able and attractive right. people will leave and others will be left behind. Some universities do that, then other universities do it, and pretty much everybody has to uh, do it. So those three mechanisms, a more ruthless economy, globalization, and technology, I think have all operated uh, to uh, create more inequality. And then inequality has been perpetuated by the fact that there are more and more ways that um, people can invest in their children. Yeah. And we believe in three things, but together they create a paradox. We believe that parents should want and try to bring about the very best for their children. That's a good value. Mm. We believe in meritocracy, that the most able should be selected for any given position. And we believe in equality of opportunity. And those things are in some tension with each other. Universities probably should choose people who do better on standardized tests than uh, people who do worse on standardized tests. On the other hand, when you can pay $1,000 an hour, and that is the going price in parts of Manhattan, for an SAT tutor, then um, you are going to, and their tutors are effective, believe me, you are going to be perpetuating um, inequality mm. from one generation to the next. And so inequality and the perpetuation of inequality of opportunity are real and challenging issues. Like, and I certainly cuts close to my bone. I live in Manhattan. I've had the experience of preparing my four-year-olds for competitive tests for <laughs> gifted and talented kindergartens. Yes. Uh, and it whiffs of eugenics. It's very distasteful. And there are people who will offer coaching for four-year-olds to take um, aptitude tests. So there certainly are. Certainly, it's, it's getting out of control. Now, perhaps the, the problem that arises out of this is that we're not, we're certainly not turning back technology. I think the gig economy, or whatever you want to call it, is, is here to stay. We're not returning to a world where people stay at the same company for a life and have a defined benefit pension. I don't really think we're turning, we're turning back globalization too much either, so this does sound like a council for despair. What are the ways you see that we can practically start to move away from the uh, obviously problematic, seriously problematic inequality that we now have? Let me first say that this is not the first time there has been seismic economic change mm. that has transformed the way people live and work. It's not the first time inequality has risen substantially. It's not the first time the country has been riven mm. by political uh, debates over what to do. These issues were the stuff of uh, the progressive yes, era. Exactly. This, these were the issues of uh, the early 1930s. And um, in their way, Bismarck in Germany, Gladstone in your country, the two Roosevelts and Woodrow Wilson in our country rose and met this challenge. What are some of the things that we can do to better meet this challenge um, today. We can run 
a high-pressure economy. You know, I've observed the Harvard Economics Department over many, many years, and sometimes there are a lot of professors and not that many graduate students. And at those times, it's fantastic to be a graduate student because all the professors want graduate students to work with, and they're really going way out of their way to be attentive to students. Yeah. At other times, there's really a lot of graduate students and not that many professors, and it's really terrible to be a graduate student. So it makes a big difference. And in the same way, a labor market where there are too many workers is very different than a labor yeah. market where there are too many jobs. And we've had a labor market in this country for some years now where there have been too many workers. Yeah. And we need to move it the other way towards a high-pressure economy. It is insane that in a country where the interest rate is zero, in a country where construction unemployment is at extraordinarily high levels, in a country where LaGuardia Airport is a pit, <laughs> that federal infrastructure investment net of depreciation is zero. It is beyond belief in a modern country, this isn't all about money, that the bridge across to the business school has been under repair for three and one half years and it takes another and it will take another year before that bridge is fixed and I've done a little research on this it's 366 feet across that bridge the Rhine is about three times as big Patton built whole new bridges Right. across the Rhine in one day. <laughs> and I'm not done yet. <laughs> There's another span of that bridge. There's another span over the Rhine, which is about 2,700 feet. Julius Caesar <laughs> built a bridge across that in 10 days. <laughs> and here in America, we are headed into our fourth year of working on extending that bridge. You laugh, right. and it is funny in a way, but often the best humor is in tragedy. And <laughs> as a matter of job creation, as a matter of preparation and efficiency, mm. it is nuts that we are not making a more satisfactory job at expanding our infrastructure, that we are not doing a better job of uh, putting people to work, right. uh, rebuilding the infrastructure of our country. When I was Treasury Secretary, I used to go visit uh, a high school every day. Every, not every day, not every day. Every time I visited another yeah. city, I would go to a public high school. And I'd give the speech about the importance of education, the kind of speech he was making fun of, um, uh, about the inadequacy of uh, education. And I gave a pretty good one, I thought, one day. And then this teacher came up to me, and she said, that was a good speech, Secretary Summers. I said, thank you. And she said, but there's something I don't understand. I said, what's that? She said, why should the kids believe it? The paint is chipping off the walls of every classroom in this school. The paint's not chipping off the walls at Walmart. The paint's not mm -hmm. chipping off the walls at McDonald's. The paint's not chipping off the walls in the movie theater. The only place where the paint is chipping off the walls is in the school. So why should they think that their education is the most important thing in the world? We say that, but how could they possibly mm. believe us? I had no answer. And there are tens of thousands of collapsing schools across the United States. So infrastructure investment is a big part. But how do you, sorry, in terms of impediments to that, why isn't infrastructure happening? Is there some, it's one, one of your, the points that you make in your report is that we need to improve long-termism among asset managers, you encourage people into, into longer term. Why isn't the private sector being brought in to actually fill that obvious need? Well, something is going wrong with the, the capitalist system if, if the money, if capital isn't flowing to the source of obvious need. Lots of the infrastructure with the biggest gaps is fundamentally public. Yes, I suppose yeah. we could turn that bridge into a toll road, <coughs> into a toll bridge, and we could make somebody pay money every time they drove across it, but it would be kind of inefficient and expensive. 
And so it really probably is best off being free. And so it's best off being run by the government. And um, look, uh, there's things that liberals are right about and there's things that right. conservatives are right about. But I guess uh, a big thing, I think, is that it's very hard to love your country and hate its government. Right. You can disagree with your government. You can think policies should be uh, different. But when you hate and reject uh, your uh, government, you are on the wrong side. And conservatives have gone completely wrong on that in uh, my view. They go completely wrong on it when they're not willing to support any kind of government spending, right. when they want to shut down the government, all of that. The left is not so terrific either. Um, thanks to the left, uh, the military were not allowed to interview on this campus uh, for many years. That's a roughly equivalent uh, kind of uh, mistake. But I think the answer lies in a, a need for, if these changes are going to be adapted to, some real changes in uh, the attitude uh, towards uh, government. Look, there's plenty wrong with government. The fact that right. they can't build that bridge is an example. But on the other hand, here's another thing to think about. Um, if you go with private pensions and 401ks and all of that, it varies from thing to thing. But roughly speaking, for every dollar somebody pays in in benefits, pays in in contributions, rather, about 85 cents goes to some retiree. And about 15 cents goes to the people who print the statements and advertise the yeah. funds and manage the money and all that. If you do the same comparison with Social Security, 99 cents gets paid out in benefits. That's a big difference. Yeah. And it's something that people who think government's always inefficient uh, should keep in mind. So, Effective government, investing, driving us to a high-pressure money, it's a different subject than mm. our subject today. Yeah. But as I have have written a number of times in the last uh, several uh, weeks, in uh, our pages. this yeah. is yeah. in your pages yeah. also, this is no time to be tightening monetary policy, not remotely a time to be tightening uh, monetary policy. Right. At the same time that inequality has gone up, we have a less progressive tax system today than we did 35 years ago. You were making fun of redistribution. Um, I'm certainly not for the politics, of, the politics of envy, but I am for taxation based on uh, ability, uh, to, uh, ability to pay. Bill Gates really made a lot of money, a lot of money, by starting Microsoft owning Microsoft stock, and he will no doubt, at the end of his life, give a lot of his Microsoft stock to his children. The wealth that was created in that Microsoft stock, what will the tax rate be on it? Zero. Zero. That is not as it should be, and there are plenty of other examples uh, one could give. So a second piece is you need an effectively progressive tax right. system and an effective uh, transfer system as well. Now there, okay, carry on. Okay, let me talk about yeah. one other, let me, there are a lot of issues, but let me just yeah. talk about one other. I think we need a reconceptualization and extension of the idea of what international economic cooperation is. Yes, international economic cooperation should be about reducing tariffs, reducing quotas, opening uh, markets. I think that's very, very important. But it also has to be about preventing uh, races uh, to uh, the bottom. I mean, think about the syllogism that, in a sense, we've gone through, or some have tried to put the United States through, and think about how working people react. First we said, well, there are all these other countries and they're producing stuff, and they're producing stuff cheaper than you can produce it, but 
we need to let the stuff in because you're really going to be much richer as a consumer. And so you're going to be better off. People didn't like it, but they kind of said, okay. Then we said, well, actually, it's not so much that we're going to let other people sell things here, but your company is going to take your job and instead of producing things here, we're going to produce things in uh, Asia and we're going to sell them here. But you have to understand that really makes your company stronger. Right. And so ultimately that's going to be better for your company and so that's going to ultimately be better for you. And people, well, a bit of a reach. <laughs> and now we're telling people, and this is the argument. This, if you read the argument, this argument is made all the time. Now we're telling people, you have to understand. We got to raise money for the government, yes. But if we raise it from corporations, they'll move to Ireland or they'll move some other place. Mm. And so that won't do us any good because then we won't have them anymore. We won't have jobs. So we have to cut their taxes. But since we have to raise revenue, if we have to cut the corporation's taxes, we have to raise your taxes. At a certain point, people just sort of get tired of that logic and it sort of doesn't add up from their, from, uh, their perspective. And the answer is that part of what international cooperation should be is trade agreements. But part of what international cooperation should be is agreements that we're not going to let there be tax evasion on the scale that we have now, that we're not going to let there be bank secrecy where people can hide their incomes, that we're not going to let there be jurisdictions where you can run a bank without any capital and cut your rates, that we're not going to let there be places where you can pollute without uh, consequence. And so the agenda of international economic cooperation can't just be a barrier busting uh, agenda. It also has to be a cooperation to make possible the pursuit of public purpose. Right. If we can get a strong, strong demand-led growth going, if we, we, in part by making fundamental investments in the future, we can move to a more progressive uh, tax system, we can foster uh, that kind of uh, international cooperation, I think we can start to renew and rebuild a world where people will see that their children have more chances than they do. I hope you're, I hope you're right. Plainly, people have been talking about currency wars yet again after China's very marginal devaluation and so on. It doesn't look as though it's a rosy picture for international cooperation at the moment, but I certainly hope you're right. Um, one topic I'd like to move on to because it's going to dominate the discussion for the, for the next day is the developing world, the problem of inclusion there. Plainly in the developing world, you do have more growth than you have here. You also have very much, and you do have a, a middle class that is getting wealthier, generally speaking, and you also obviously have much more grotesque, much more severe inequality. How do you apply some of the lessons that you've been ad adopting for the, for the, uh, the US, the UK, the developed world? How, much, how applicable are these to the developing world, to the debate that, um, that's going to be going on over the next 24 hours? John, I'd say two things. First, if you were viewing this all from Mars, or you were viewing this all from the as historians will mm. in 2500, the unbelievably phenomenal thing that has happened over the last 30 years is that inequality on planet Earth is way, way, way down. Yes, it's true that inequality within the United States is greater than it's used to be. Yes, it's true that inequality within China is greater than it used to be. But China, which used to be vastly poorer than the United States, is now only significantly poorer mm, than right. the United States. And so the convergence of the developing world has led to any measure of inequality among the 7 billion people on Earth Right. is much lower than it used to be. Or, uh, to quote from a commission that I was privileged to chair on uh, 
global, on uh, global health, it is a reasonable prospect, indeed I think a fairly confident expectation, that uh, with reasonable efforts, child mortality, child mortality around the world in 2030 will be significantly lower than child mortality was in the United States when I was born. That uh, when I was born in 1954 in the world, one out of five children died before the age of five. Just about every family lost a child. After a while, it was just about everyone had someone in their extended family who lost a child. But within 15 years, it will be as it was in the, the United States several decades ago. That is a fantastic achievement for mankind. So when we talk about these equality questions, mm. we need to think about them from the perspective of within country. And obviously, it's not much consolation within a country to know what's happening globally. Mm. But one does need to maintain that perspective. And anybody who thinks that the global development effort is failing just needs to look at the data. It is remarkably positive what has happened over the last 25 years. It's true if you look at number of people under a dollar a day. It's true if you look at uh, child mortality. It's true if you look at literacy. It's true if you look at the number of people who have to who have to breathe air with more particulates than mm. uh, some threshold. In the developing world, I think these basic uh, perspectives are right. Uh, but look, it, if you look at the countries, if you look across yeah. countries, if you look across countries, the countries where the poorest fifth enjoy the most rapid economic growth are the countries that have the most rapid economic growth overall. So the number one most important part of a strategy for raising the income of the poorest people in China or the poorest people in India or the poorest people in Chad is causing their economies to grow more rapidly. And that goes back to the fundamental questions of adequate, inv adequate investment, market institutions, and all of that. A second part is the appropriate fiscal measures, which go to both social safety nets and to uh, satisfactory, right. satisfactorily progressive taxation. Okay, I'd just like to say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question then I'd like to open up to questions from the audience. The microphones are there if people want to take their positions to ask questions. Uh, I think one question that I have to ask, or one name that has to arise in any discussion like this is uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, who you know uh, our Financial Times has a famously complicated uh, relationship with, uh, with Piketty, but he has changed the debate with uh, his very strong focus in, on inequality and the, uh, the notion that, that a global wealth tax is, is possible uh, and, the, and desirable. Um, is there something to be said for taking even more radical steps in terms of raising taxation, particularly attacking wealth, than you are suggesting, particularly given the mood across the world. There's a, there's a lot of space between Tony Blair or Bill Clinton and um, you know, Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn, but at the moment the voters don't seem to be wanting to, to go there. There is an interest in more radical ideas. Is there a case for a global wealth tax or for significantly higher top rates? Sorry, there is a case. No article, no article in no, no article in the Financial Times that has used the words Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> has not also used the word unelectable. <laughs> and I imagine the Financial Times knows of what it speaks. So it's my old I, MP. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a mis so I think that <laughs> just in terms of assessing sure, but what the national what what attitudes are. I don't think too it's, many people it, think Bernie Sanders is going to get in here either. But, I think, but, but, but it's interesting I'm not gonna, that I'm that not gonna comment on, I'm not yeah. going to comment on that. Yeah. But yeah. I think the... Um, yeah. But So I think that in terms of where, in terms of what there's popular support mm. for, I think there's a difference between recognizing an uprising 
and detecting what a general sentiment sure. uh, is. Um, anybody who's interested can read uh, my review of Piketty's book, which is on the Democracy Magazine and on my website. It uh, applauds the uh, care and depth of the empirical scholarship while expressing significant doubt about the particular theory the, the, that, the, he advocates, that he advocates, that he advocates right. for why wealth will inherently uh, grow and uh, become and become more concentrated over time. I don't. I don't think it's. I, I don't think it's stood up so well as the most likely mechanism. I don't think a worldwide wealth tax is remotely feasible politically. I think mm. there's no I think there's no support anywhere. I mean we're we're we are struggling and you expressed considerable skepticism a few minutes ago about an ability to get some cooperation so nations On didn't taxes. undercut each other yeah. by cutting their corporate taxes. So the notion that we're gonna let the UN, to whom we have trouble getting agreement to pay dues, levy <laughs> levy some kind of global wealth tax does not seem to doesn't seem to me uh, to be a uh, remotely real a remotely uh, realistic uh, kind of notion, and I think that the at least a large part of what is most worrisome about inequality is summarized by observations like. Uh, the fact that CEOs used to make 30 times what average workers make, and now they make 300 times what average workers make. And that doesn't, that's not touched by right. the Piketty-like discussion on uh, comparing rates of return and growth rates. There's some notion in which the whole concept of shareholder value has been allowed to get out of control, that the CEO compensation has its own specific uh, issues. That issue has a variety, that issue certainly has a variety of complexities. Right. Are there any questions for, I'm oh, sorry, I should give the ground rules. Please, first of all, introduce yourself. Secondly, hard though it is, restrict yourself to only one question uh, and make sure that it is a question rather than a statement. Thank you, my name is Claire Kamanzi and I'm from Rwanda. Uh, I'd like to hear your views uh, about the role of non-state actors in intervening for inclusion, like NGOs. There's been a proliferation of NGOs in Africa, and their results has been debatable, you know, whether they've been successful or not. And I'd like to hear your views. Do you think NGOs have a role, and what do you think uh, the performance has been? Thank you. I think it's like many, I think it's like many things. I, I don't think there's any question that um, NGOs have been hugely successful innovators in a whole variety of areas. Microcredit stands out mm. as uh, an example. I think that NGOs have led traditional assistance agencies and uh, the global banks, global development banks, to be much more accountable than they would have been uh, if there weren't uh, NGOs. So there's been an enormous accomplishment. I think that there are questions of accountability of large institutions and there are questions of accountability of NGOs as well. And I think there probably have been occasions also on which um, NGOs have pursued particular parochial agendas that have not been constructive from the point of view of the development of overall societies. And I think that small may be beautiful, but large is often more potent and effective. And so I think there has been some tendency in the NGO movement to denigrate the role of things that are really are important for development like the production of electricity on large on a large scale. So as a whole, I have huge admiration uh, for the NGO movement and 
one of the things that I take the most satisfaction in having done um, during my various stints in office was having worked with uh, Oxfam and a number of other NGOs to support the uh, Jubilee debt relief that took place for the world's poorest countries uh, in 2000. But at the same time, I, I think there also have been excesses on the part of the NGO movement. Next question. Hello, my name is Mitch Ambrose. You emphasize the importance of moving from an economy in which there's uh, too, too, many, too few jobs, too many workers, to an economy in which there's too few jobs. However, at the moment, and also I mean, in the past, a considerable amount of research and development has been directed either directly or indirectly at replacing humans. Think of the driverless car. What happens if the future holds fewer jobs? I think um, that it is unimaginable that there will not be plenty of work to do. If you think about the number of aging people who need to be taken care of, if you think about the number of children who are not appreciated and coached and well, uh, well taught, if you think about the amount of nature there is to be preserved, I don't think we are near a point where there isn't enough work to do, even if ways of being found for substituting for various categories of labor. I think there are very fundamental questions of whether there's enough work to do that is supported by a traditional private sector business, business model. And that's why I think that in the same way we saw major changes in the role of public institutions in the early part of the 20th century, we're going to need to see major changes uh, in uh, the 21st century. But I would be very skeptical of any view that sought to choke off productive innovation on the grounds that somehow it would cost jobs. I think there are plenty of unmet needs uh, that people can very productively work to meet. And that will be true even if no human being needs ever to drive a car again. And I don't think that day is going to come anytime too, too soon. Can I quickly ask one follow-up, which is one of the, in your section on educational opportunities in the um, um, Inclusive Prosperity Report, there's this, you cite very interesting research saying that we should think of this not as a race against the machine, but a race between education and technology. Is that, are there specific educational changes uh, or that we can do to, to limit the, uh, the harm that technology can do to, to job creation? Look, I think education is going to have to change in very uh, important ways uh, in, uh, in, the years, in the years ahead. Uh, the ability to work on an assembly line is going to become less and less relevant. Right. And developing the discipline that that requires is going to become a less important aspect of education. Developing the ability to relate effectively to other people, to work effectively in teams, to marshal complex analysis and evidence to solve problems, these are things that are going to become much more important. And I think these are things that are going to need to become increasingly uh, the focus of education. If you take just one example that I've always been struck by, um, there is nothing that I did, almost nothing, uh, that I did from the time I left school in which my success or failure was only determined by the quality of my effort. Hmm. Everything I did when I worked in government, when I worked as president of Harvard, when I worked as a professor uh, here, depended on my ability to work effectively, or lack of ability to work effectively, as it turned out in some cases, 
um, with, uh, with others right. to accomplish particular objectives. And yet, if you think about school, in the way our education system is designed, mm. with respect to most of what happens, the worst thing you can do is to cooperate with somebody else. I'm doing your homework or taking a test or whatever. And so I think that Taking developing the, the skills model, right? of teamwork yeah. and cooperation mm. is going to become a very important and much more important aspect of education in the years ahead. Very interesting point for other running Harvard, I would think. Ne next question. <coughs> Hi. Uh, in the light of the recently... Sorry, your name, uh, please. Uh, I'm Fidel Mendez and MPAID one. Uh, in the light of the recently uh, stated uh, sustainable development goals, where is your stand over the selection of these goals and the actual uh, feasibility of uh, reaching the, the goals proposed? I, I, I'm not completely satisfied with them. I don't think anything I don't think any set of goals that you set is going to be completely satisfying to everybody. You know, 17 broad areas of goals, and I don't remember whether it's 167 or 169 sub-goals, um, strikes me as being way too many. And I wouldn't have any difficulty saying which ones should be emphasized and which ones should be de-emphasized. Most other people wouldn't have any, most, most people agree that 167 is probably 150 too many, but they don't agree on which 150 should be cut and which 17 should be saved, and that's why we have 100, that's why we have as many goals uh, as we do. So I think it is a usefully galvanizing of energy uh, project that's probably, uh, Imperfect. It's probably imperfect in uh, its design, but I think its uh, imperfections are probably much less of a negative than the moral energy it generates is a positive. We have the next question here, please. Good evening. My name is Alfonso La Torre. I'm from the MPAID program. Um, you've been talking over the last year or so about secular extinction as a possible framework, a way of understanding the, the challenges to growth in developed economies. Some have looked at this explanation and tried to combine it with inequality of income or of opportunity, trying to say that perhaps this accumulation of income at the top explains the excess savings in developed economies. I wanted to know what is your opinion of this, and if there is a connection in your opinion, what are the policy implications? In a, sent in a, in a couple sentences, Secular stagnation is the idea that there's an excess of savings over investment, that interest rates can't fall that much, therefore you always have more savings than investment, therefore the economy is short on demand, therefore it grows slowly and has a tendency to deflation. That's what secular stagnation is. One of the possible reasons why there would be an excess of savings over investment is that there would be an increase in saving caused by the fact that when there's more inequality, the rich are more likely to save a dollar and the poor are more likely to spend a dollar, so widening inequality means higher saving. My guess is that widening inequality is a contributor to the secular stagnation phenomenon. I'd be surprised if it was the dominant contributor to the secular stagnation phenomenon. But I think in general, one of the many virtues of finding policies that would cause more income to go to the middle class would be that it would tend to raise spending, raise demand, and help offset secular stagnation. Okay. Larry has kindly pointed out to me that the speaker's waiting very patiently in the, the loggia. Um, we are slightly over, over time now, so I, would, I will take first you and then the final question from there. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Mehek, and I'm studying uh, MPP. My question is around global inclusion, and uh, we've already discussed that a global wealth tax is not feasible. However, uh, what if when we're trying to increase the pie for developing countries, it's kind of claiming a part of the pie from the developed ones, 
you know, in line with the world systems theory. So what do you think, like, what are your thoughts on how <laughs> is the way forward uh, if we want to solve the challenge of global inclusion? Feel free. It's Margaret. I'm at the business school. Uh, my question is about if a developing country had to choose between inclusive growth and just growth, even though it's like unevenly distributed, should they worry about just growing now and distributing the pie later? Because to me, it seems like uh, inclusive growth is sort of a luxury for developed economies at the moment. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Uh, I, I did some work when I was at uh, the World Bank uh, as its chief economist in the early 1990s um, in which we showed that educating girls was the highest return investment available in the developing world. We did calculations suggesting that the rate of return on that investment was 18%, 20% when you measured all the various benefits uh, that it brought. 18 or 20% return investments are investments that are well worth, uh, well worth making. So I think many of the highest return investments are investments in those with lower incomes. They are in educating uh, children and the like. They are in fundamental health care. And so I think that a strategy of making the highest return investments will include many investments that also promote uh, inclusive, will also promote inclusivity. I think many of my friends who are most concerned about inequality make a mistake, though, in supposing that a focus on making things more equal within countries is sufficient. The truth is that having the pie grow more rapidly is not, a, is not, it's not that helping the poor is any kind of luxury. If you don't do it, you're missing many of the highest return investments. But on the other hand, uh, in a society where the pie is growing faster, standards of living of the poor will increase more rapidly. And what's true for country, what's true for each of us as individuals is true for countries as well. If I asked you, in which situation would you be likely to do more that was altruistic? A situation where your income went up by 15% next year, or a situation where your income went up by 2%, I think almost all of you would recognize that you'd somehow be more likely to find resources to do altruistic things if you were growing, uh, if your income was growing more rapidly. And so that's an additional reason why promoting growth is, I think, something that very much uh, supports um, the uh, uh, very very much supports the middle class and the poor. I think the look. I think there are a set of um, strategies um, for promoting uh, assistance and for encouraging. Uh, larger volumes of uh, foreign aid. But I think we have to be, and I have worked very hard when I was at Treasury, worked very hard when I was at the World Bank, worked very hard in the context of this Global Health uh, Commission to support the increased mobilization of resources to flow from the industrial world to the developing world to support development. That said, I think an honest person looking at it has to recognize that the dominant determinant of what happens in the developing world is going to be the policy choices that are made in particular developing countries, is going to be the work ethic, is going to be the spirit of entrepreneurship that takes place within developing countries. And, uh, the study at the World Bank uh, in the early 90s of the East Asian miracle was mentioned uh, earlier. I was actually the chief economist at the time, so I had a lot to do with that study. And one of the things that is absolutely clear in that study is that foreign aid was not the reason for uh, the takeoff. And indeed, there are even some arguments 
that uh, what drove South Korea's takeoff was some slowdown in the extent of American aid that forced an increased emphasis on self-reliance. So I'm a believer in uh, foreign assistance, but I think that the success in exporting, creating an environment that attracts foreign investment and create and attracts uh, foreign technology, these are crucial aspects of achieving more rapid growth and are probably more important uh, in some ultimate sense uh, than foreign aid. Okay, with that, I'm afraid to say it feels as though we are only just beginning to get into this remarkably deep, complicated and important subject, but in fact we have already significantly overrun. I'm afraid, I'm afraid time is up. I would merely like to say thank you very much to Larry Summers. It's been fascinating. <laughs> We've learned a lot. <laughs> Come back tomorrow and there is a whole forum to discuss more of the specifics. Thank you.